segment, but we needed to lay that, that foundation to really uh, dig into this, this second part here. And um, we're going to begin in the book of Luke chapter 4 and verses 16 through 21. Luke 4 verses 16 through 21. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of our Lord. Verse 20, And He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all the people in the synagogue were intently directed at Him. Now he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Bold statements. So Jesus made the statement that in his first coming, that this passage was literally fulfilled. But we need to make note of where Jesus stopped reading that day in the temple. Jesus actually stopped in mid-sentence for a reason. Because that passage perfectly encapsulated his ministry on earth during his first coming. If Jesus had read one line further, then he could not have made the statement, Today, this is being fulfilled. Okay? Well, you have to read the next line in order to to, to find out why. The next line is, And the day of vengeance, and the day of vengeance of our God. Okay? I have some, thank you. And the day of vengeance of our God. So he's basically saying that today this is being fulfilled, but I have not yet come to bring vengeance. That that is going to be fulfilled in the future. Do you understand? Did Jesus come the first time to bring vengeance? Did we see, What did he do to the Roman soldier that Peter cut his ear off of? He healed it, right? He didn't come to bring vengeance at that time. That was not the purpose. Jesus chose to only read about the purpose he was there to fulfill at that time. His judgment was coming in the future, and so he stopped reading right where he stopped reading. The following uh, in that passage in Isaiah 61, we see specifically speaks of Israel. And it gives a description of their healing, their comforting, and their restoration. Again, It's talking about the regeneration, the times of refreshing. Isaiah 61.4 says, Isaiah 61.4, and and so on. So we're picking up right where Jesus rolled up the scroll and set it down. If he had kept reading, he would have said, The day of vengeance of our God, and then beginning in verse 4, Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations. They will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers will stand and pasture your flocks, and foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers. But you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat of the wealth of nations and you will boast in their riches. Instead of your shame, you will have a double portion. And instead of humiliation, they will shout for joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion. Interesting three words here. In their land, everlasting joy will be theirs. So it will take place in their land. And that passage perfectly encapsulates God's purpose for Israel in His second coming in the time of regeneration. First, to purify them through the trials of the actual tribulation. And then He will take His throne over all the earth and He will not only literally fulfill every promise to the descendants of Abraham, but also, as the last Adam, He will reclaim and restore all. Every single thing that the first Adam had lost in the Garden of Eden. And the Bible says this period of time will last 1,000 years. The time of peace and righteousness from the top down. Perfect peace in humanity. No war. 
perfect peace in the spiritual world because all of these fallen spiritual beings, we are told, will be cast into the bottomless pit and bound. Healing available for everyone. Lifespans elongated once again as we see in Isaiah 65, 18 through 20. Isaiah 65, 18 through 20. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. Rejoicing in the creation itself. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives only a few days or an old person who does not live out his days. And even in the animal kingdom as it was in the beginning, it will return to a, an, Eden, an Edenic state as it was uh, in the beginning. The whole earth from top down, Jesus Christ literally reigning over all creation peacefully as a man, okay? Now, the reason I say as a man, we'll touch on that in a moment. In Isaiah 11, we see a wonderful prophetic description of the 1,000-year reign of Christ on the earth. Again, Isaiah 11, starting in verse 1, Then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Now, Jesse, we know, is the father of King David. Okay, speaking of the lineage, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make decisions by what his ears hear. So in other words, you and I, when we're trying to make a judgment of someone, we judge on what we see and what we hear coming out of the mouth of who we're speaking to. This judge will not do that. He will know the thoughts and the intents of the heart. He will judge righteously in perfect righteousness. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the humble of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be the belt around his hips and faithfulness the belt around his waist. Listen to this. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. And the leopard will lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fattened steer will be together. And a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And on that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, that's Jesus, who will stand as a signal flag for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. This is the glorious seventh day, all right, when, when Christ will bring his perfect righteousness and the earth itself will return to the way it was, even in the animal kingdom, uh, before sin entered into the world. And it culminates at the end of the thousand-year reign, the actual end of time, as Jesus Christ will lay aside his authority as in, in the office of a man, the last Adam, and he will resume his authority over eternity within the Godhead. He will submit all things back to God, and Paul describes this office of man in 1 Corinthians 15. He lays out a timeline for us. If you want to look there, turn there, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. But this passage is about the very end of time. The final resurrection of the dead. All enemies defeated once and for all. And this is the transition from time to beyond time into eternity future. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 26. And again, he connects it to Adam, all right? He says, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and after that, those who are, in, who are Christ at his coming. So Christ was resurrected, a guarantee that there is a resurrection for everyone in the future. Verse 24, then comes the end. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to our God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. 
So notice that word there, until, in verse 25. This I was just reading one day, and this jumped off the page at me. He will reign until? That doesn't really make sense to me, uh, because we're told in Isaiah 9 that there will be no end to his reign. So what gives? Is this a contradiction in Scripture? I have learned... No, it's never a contradiction in Scripture. It's always my, my, the capacity of my brain to comprehend Scripture, all right? So let's look at that passage in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. It's, of course, now one of these other um, speakers may touch on mountain peaks and prophecy. Uh, I don't know, but, but basically in a very simplistic form, when you look across a range of mountain peaks, you can't see the valleys in between. You can only see the peaks of mountains. Well, there's a similar thing in prophecy. When you have a prophecy stated or, or declared, and then there's a valley in between, a valley of time, and, and, a, and time passes, and then the next thing that's stated could possibly happen, you know, hundreds or thousands, a couple thousand years later. Do you understand? So we see this as an example in in a couple different ways in this passage. Verse 6, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, okay? And we know that that was fulfilled in Christ's birth. Uh, it says, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And look, the government he means the government. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything other than the government. And it says, right, it always, government's always speaking of thrones and dominion and rulers and powers and that. Verse 7, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Now watch carefully. On the throne of David, so he mentions the throne of David, and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. So again, Jesus is often connected with Adam and David throughout the whole of Scripture, both men given dominion over the earth, in David's case, a portion of the earth, given dominion by the Father. And these passages tell us that Christ will take up that dominion as the last Adam in the lineage of, upon the throne of David, and, and it will be given to him by the Father. And from the point he establishes full authority over the earth in the office of man, and his dominion, that his dominion from that point on will last forever. But his dominion... As the last Adam, hopefully you're following me here, as, a, as the theocratic administrator, as the, the last Adam, the man reigning in the lineage of David, that will end at a very specific time. And it says that time is when all things are put under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says, All rule, authority, and power within the created order at that time will cease to exist. Okay, From then on, there will be no more death as well. So we see this as a future promise. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 27 and 28. He says, but he has put all things in subjection under his feet. All things have been placed under his feet. And when he says all things are put in subjection, he's clarifying, it's clear this excludes the Father who put all things in subjection to Christ. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him. So he's giving all authority back to the Father. Does that make sense? You can get a little caught up in the, in the verbiage and in the, in the language there. So God may be all in all. So there's no more separation with rule and reign, and uh, eternity will then consist of, of only one reigning, and that is the, in the perfection of the Godhead. Okay? So we see that there's a period of time in the future where Christ will reign on the throne of David as the last Adam, during which the time, the government of the whole earth will be on his shoulders. And after the 1,000 years of holding this dominion as a man, all created reality and spiritual and physical will be placed under his feet, all of it. And we will transition from the temporal to the eternal and all things will be made new at that time. A complete and total renovation of creation described by Paul in Romans 8, 19. By Isaiah in Isaiah 65, 17. By John in Revelation 21, 12. And by Peter in 2 Peter 3, 10 and 13. 
So this final all things being made new will take place at the book end of time, at the omega of time. And this, grand, this, this is the grand entrance of all reality, physical and spiritual, into the perfected eternal state, emerging, uh, the emerging once again of the seen and unseen dimensions, all for the glory of God and all for His pleasure at the end of time. All evil that exists, all the sin uh, and, and all that sin has contaminated across time in both the material and the spiritual world. We see at the very end of this thousand-year reign, during the, the thousand-year reign, uh, Satan, the enemy, and, and the, the, these demonic forces are cast into the bottomless pit so they can't have influence over mankind. But we see that at the end of this thousand-year reign, Satan is loosed upon the earth to tempt the nations at that time. And he will incite a final rebellion of humanity and fallen spiritual beings against Christ. They're going to rise up. Can, can you imagine this? Just stop and, and think for a moment. Christ has been reigning righteously in perfect righteousness. You want a perfect government? You have Christ sitting on the throne of the earth. And at the end of that, it will still not be good enough. Man will still raise their fist in the face of God and rebel against him. And so, uh, under the influence, obviously, of these demonic beings that are at that time released. And the final judgment of all judgments will occur. All evil will be judged and brought to justice in the lake of fire for eternity and presided over by the Lamb of God. He is presiding over the punishment of the wicked. And the final enemy that is destroyed will be death. And all things will be, I like to use the phrase, locked in. It's going to be locked in for all eternity. Righteousness or wickedness. Whichever you have chosen in this life, it will be locked in forever. With no potential for those who have chosen righteousness to ever be corrupted again. And no potential for those who have chosen wickedness to ever be restored to God again. It's a done deal. You are locked in. And we see this stated in Revelation 22.10. He says, let the ones who do wrong still do wrong. The ones who are filthy still be filthy. Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. And the one who is holy still be holy. It's locked in. So the Old Testament prophets taught of this regeneration and the restoration of all things. Jesus taught of the regeneration. This is a theme all throughout Scripture. The apostles believed and taught of this regeneration, and Jesus didn't correct them before he ascended to the Father. Well, what about after that? What did the early church believe? What did the church fathers believe? Okay? Because there are those these days who would have you believe that the idea of this regeneration or the thousand-year reign of Christ is something that has just been invented in the last couple hundred years. And... and or, or that it's some wild interpretation that was never taught before. Well, I want to show you that it's impossible for that to be the case. Okay? I can assure you that the historical record of the church and those who led the church in the early centuries after the birth of the church believed these things and taught these things. We know that some of the most prominent early church fathers interpreted scripture regarding the end times, regarding the, the regeneration Regarding all things being made new, they, they uh, interpret it literally the way I have expressed today. And especially, the closer the, the teachers were to the disciples and the Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, the more they believed and taught these things. Okay, The literal 1,000-year reign of Christ... And, and some even wrote of a pre-trib rapture, if you can believe it. Now, let me say from the outset, and I want to be very clear about this, that these are extra-biblical quotes. This is not to be held at the same standard as Scripture, okay? Um, but I think it's important to refute the idea that these things we're discussing today were just invented within the last few years because that's becoming more and more prevalent among the church today. Um, so we know that for a time the Apostle John lived in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and he had some disciples there that he taught. One of his disciples was Polycarp, and there was Justin Martyr, and there was Papias. Now, I have no idea 
if I'm pronouncing these names right, but I'm going to fake it till I make it. I'm going to say the name with confidence. Amen? So they had some disciples after that as well that were closely connected to the teachings of the Apostle John, and I want to look at some of these writings today. So Papias, uh, between 60 and 130 A.D., he was a first and second generation disciple. And Irenaeus wrote that Papias was a hearer of John, meaning that he sat under the, the Apostle John's teaching and was also a companion to Polycarp. And we believe that many of his writings were destroyed when that great uh, fire happened at the, the uh, Library of Alexandria. There was a man by the name of uh, Eusebius, and he was what we would all consider a liberal historian in the 4th century, and he wrote about Papias's writings because uh, he read them before they had been destroyed in that fire. And I want to read a quote of Eusebius's view of the writings of Papias. You guys follow me? So, so he was writing from a liberal perspective about what he had read Papias had written. So here's what he writes, quote, Papias gives also other accounts which he says came to him through unwritten tradition, certain strange parables and teachings of the Savior, and some are more mythical things. So, Brother Tim, these, the idea of things being a fairy tale has been around forever, okay? It's always been attacked as fairy tale, mythical things. He says, to these belong his statement that there was a period of some thousand years after the resurrection of the dead, and that the kingdom of Christ will be set up in material form on this very earth. So if a particular belief didn't exist before 200 years ago, then why is it being attacked all the way back then? It had to exist in order for Eusebius to try to refute it. And even then, 400 years into church history, the liberals were attacking the truth. Amen? Calling into question the early church belief in this 1,000-year reign of Christ. Eusebius also called uh, the book of Revelation a fraud. So there's that. That shows you how much credibility he had. Then we have Justin Martyr, around 100 to 165 AD. He was a second generation disciple. He was likely acquainted with Polycarp, who was one of John's disciples. And it's likely he would have known Papias during his time in Ephesus, in that ministry in the early church. Now, in a debate written back and forth with a man named Trypho, Trypho wrote to Justin Martyr and he asked this question. But tell me, Justin, because you know back then they had to write letters. Y'all, young people, y'all know that? Okay. But tell me, Justin, do you really admit that this place, Jerusalem, shall be rebuilt? And do you expect your people to be gathered together and made joyful with Christ and the patriarchs and the prophets, both the men of our nation, the Jews, and other proselytes who joined them before your Christ came? Or have you given way and admitted this in order to have the appearance of worsting us in the controversies, in these debates? And of course, Justin Martyr responds, I am not so miserable a fellow, Trypho, as to say one thing and think another. I admitted to you formally that I and many others are of this opinion and believe that such will take place, as you assuredly are aware. But on the other hand, I signify to you that many who belong to the pure and pious faith and are true Christians think otherwise. So there's an important lesson to learn here. There are going to be many speakers today. You will hear many people take different positions on all of this eschatological stuff. And as long as we aren't departing from the essentials of the faith, we are all believers in Christ. So we need to realize that and understand that and not allow it to cause division to the point that there's a fraction in the body of Christ or fracturing in the body of Christ. Continued, he says, uh, but I and others who are right-minded Christians on all point, I, I, I like that. He's like, oh, now here's what I think. I like to call it the right way, okay, um, are assured that there will be a resurrection of the dead and a thousand years in Jerusalem, which will then be built, adorned, and enlarged as the prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah and others have declared. So it's pretty clear he's basically saying, there are plenty of us at this time who believe in the physical resurrection followed by the millennial reign of Christ. It was something that they believed in the early church. Irenaeus, or Irenaeus 
140 to 202 AD. Uh, he was a second generation disciple, an actual disciple of Polycarp, who again was John's disciple. So the idea here is that the closer in proximity you get to the writer of Revelation and what he understood as the teaching of Revelation and in times that you would get closer to the truth in the early church because these church fathers were not divinely inspired as was the apostles. Give me an amen or a head nod if you get that. Okay, so here's one of his quotes from Against Heresies. The predicted blessing, therefore, belongs unquestionably to the times of the kingdom, when the righteous shall bear up rule on their rising from the dead, when also the creation, having been renovated and set free, shall fructify with an abundance of all kinds of food, from the dew of heaven and from the fertility of the earth, as the elders who saw John, the disciple of the Lord, related that they had heard from him how the Lord Jesus used to teach in regard to these times. Now, this I find fascinating, that you've got accounts from the apostles. We know that everything in Scripture is not everything that Jesus said. Can you imagine? We have the high points. And we understand that, of course, we don't want to speculate too far, okay? And sometimes it's easy to do that. But he's saying Christ used to teach the apostles this stuff. They used to sit around a campfire eating fish, and he'd talk about this. And he says, so John used to tell us or tell them that Jesus said these things. The days will come in which vines shall grow, each having 10,000 branches, and each branch 10,000 twigs, and in each true twig 10,000 shoots, and in each one of the shoots 10,000 clusters, and on every one of the clusters 10,000 grapes, and every grape when pressed will give five and twenty metriots of wine, and when any one of the saints shall lay hold of a cluster, another cluster will cry out, I'm a better cluster, take me, bless the Lord through me. In like manner, the Lord declared that all animals will be feeding only on the productions of the earth. In those days, become peaceful and harmonious among each other, and be in perfect subjection to man. And these things are bore witness to in the writings of Papias, the hearer of John, and a companion of Polycarp in his fourth book, for, there, for where there were five books compiled by him. And he says in addition, now these things are credible to believers. It's okay to believe these things. You're not a nut, okay? And against heresies in 534... Even though the Romans had destroyed the Jewish temple just 110 years earlier, Irenaeus still wrote about the Antichrist defiling a future temple at the midpoint of the tribulation, just as Jesus said would happen. In other words, he, he sure didn't believe that these, um, these prophecies had already been fulfilled before, okay, during Nero's reign. It says, quote, But when this Antichrist shall have devastated all things in this world, he will reign for three years and six months and sit in the temple at Jerusalem. And then the Lord will come from heaven in the clouds in the glory of the Father, sending this man and those who follow him into the lake of fire, but bringing in for the righteous the times of the kingdom, that is, the rest, the hallowed seventh day, and restoring to Abraham the promised inheritance in which kingdom the Lord declared that many coming from the east and the west will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? And, and again, and against heresies 5.35, for all these and other words were unquestionably spoken in reference to the resurrection of the just, which takes place after the coming of the Antichrist and the destruction of all the nations under his rule. In the times of which the resurrection of the righteous shall reign in the earth, waxing stronger by the sight of the Lord. And listen what he, he, he says here. And nothing is capable of being allegorized, but all things are steadfast and true and substantial, having been made by God for righteous men's enjoyment. So he's making the statement here that if you allegorize it, you allegorize the meaning right out of it, that it can mean anything. As, as many interpreters as would be out there, that's how many different interpretations you would have if you choose to allegorize the Scripture. Okay, Tertullian, in the late 2nd century, in Against Marcion, he says, of the heavenly kingdom, this is the process. All right? This is the process. After its thousand years are over, 
Within each period is completed the resurrection of the saints who rise sooner or later according to their deserts. And that means rewards. Don't let your mind drift too far to lunch, okay? He's according to their rewards. There will ensue the destruction of the world and the conflagration of all things at the judgment. And add to the list of those who aligned to these beliefs. We've got uh, uh, Hippolytus, Africanus, Lactantius, uh, Commodianus. That's an unfortunate name, but nevertheless, uh, Methodius. Uh, one church father, Cyprian and Pseudo Ephraim, also wrote about the rapture taking place before the tribulation. Cyprian in 200 AD to 258 AD in the treatises of Cyprian wrote, We who see that terrible things have begun and know that still more terrible things are imminent may regard it as to the greatest advantage to depart from it as quickly as possible. Do you not give God thanks? Do you not congratulate yourself that by an early departure you are taken away and delivered from the shipwrecks and disasters that are imminent? Let us greet the day which assigns each of us to his own home, which snatches us hence and sets us free from the snares of the world and restores us to paradise and the kingdom. And then, of course, you have a pseudo Ephraim in a sermon entitled On the Last Times, the Antichrist and the End of the World. And this was in, uh, well, actually, 306 to 373 A.D. For all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord, lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. So we can easily make a case that the early church fathers believed and taught these things. At least many of them did. I'm certain there were debates and controversies back then as there are today. But taking a literal approach to Scripture is not a no-no. You can do that, and it's okay. I want to give you my permission. Okay, if that matters at all, it doesn't. I'll go ahead and spoil that for you. But although they were not perfect, they give us confidence that we are on the right track theologically. So in closing, eschatology, the study of end times, is so important because it, the end of the story matters. How many of you guys have ever started a book that you were really, really into and laid it down before you read the ending? Most things that are written, almost every story that is written, it culminates and is all about the ending and what takes place. So God's redemptive history is written in such a way that we might understand and have confidence in how it's all going to culminate and come to an end. We can know exactly what the future holds as much as God has revealed it in his word. And beyond that, we don't need to know anything more. He's given us exactly what we need to know, and it's enough, okay? We have the story of the beginning in Genesis, and in that also, we should believe that God has revealed what he wants us to know and trust him. If I hear one more person say it doesn't matter if it was seven literal days or if it took uh, millennia, it does matter. Believe God. It matters. He says he's given us the account of the early years of God's redemptive history in the pages of the Old Testament through the pages of the New Testament. And God continues to write his story from the close of the New Testament up until now. We are connected to the saints of the historical church. Uh, we shouldn't think that we've got all the answers, that they were dumb, unenlightened idiots, uh, and that we know everything and we know how to do everything. And we've lost a ton uh, over the last several decades in the way we've shifted worship in the body of Christ. That's another sermon. I'm going to stop there. But we now await the final chapters to be revealed in the end, a return to what life was like before sin, before the fall. His story will culminate in the accomplishment of His purpose for His own glory and for His own pleasure. And there is no reason for you, church, to resign in disbelief or resort to allegorizing or spiritualizing God's Word until the prophecy in it has no meaning whatsoever. Creation began with heaven and earth, with spirit beings and earthly beings coexisting as God reigned from above. And in the end, there will be a new heaven and a new earth with beings of flesh and spirit, glorified bodies indwelled by the Spirit of God and, and ministering spirits being, uh, be, spirit beings to glorify God forever as well. Creation began designed to sustain life 
an ample supply of food and no natural disasters, also peace between man and the animal kingdom and peace within the animal kingdom. In the end, creation will once again be designed to sustain us for eternity. <clears throat> food will be eaten for pleasure and fellowship. Can I get an amen? Natural disasters will cease to exist. And the animal kingdom will once again be at total peace. In the beginning, creation was all good in the sight of God, but it was susceptible to corruption and deceit. But in the end, all of creation will be perfected, never again vulnerable to evil or corruption. There will be no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. And that, that old, stinky enemy, death, that pierces our hearts so in this life will be defeated once and for all. In the beginning, God inscribed his name upon the land of Israel with the intention of upholding his covenant with the descendants of Abraham. He made Jerusalem a holy city and reserved it for his future reign. And in the end, upon the remaking of the new heaven and the new earth, a new Jerusalem will descend from heaven and God will dwell in the midst of his creation. God will bring an end of time to a close with the same incredible supernatural power and perfect precision that he did in the beginning when he spoke and the cosmos obeyed and took shape. God has declared his purpose from eternity past and he will accomplish it for his glory in eternity future. As it was in the beginning, it will be in the end. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> I'm colorblind, so I can't tell. I could tell the light was on, and that's it. Well, I know a lot of you have come in since we started this morning, and um, so I just wanted to say, well, again, welcome to Bright Star Church. And I'm Pastor Brad, we're, and everybody with these little lanyards is from the church, and we're your hosts today, and we're glad that you're here. Um, now, we took a, a little poll, and, and, and everybody said they'd just rather continue with the teaching and don't want lunch. So, oh, no, oh, okay, sorry. Maybe that wasn't an accurate poll. All right. Uh, lunch will be served. It's going to be over in the gym, just out the double doors and down the little uh, alleyway there. And if you have paid online or paid this morning, then uh, great. If you haven't, there's a bucket over there at the beginning of the line you can throw some money into. If you didn't bring any money or you've already given it to your teenagers like me, then please be our guests, okay? That food is over there for us to be eating today, and if we don't eat it, it just has to be thrown away. So be our guests and go on and, and enjoy some fellowship with us. Now, um, front porch team, please make your way out there. Thank you. If you're a guest here, uh, I'm going to pray in just a minute, but if you're a guest here um, uh, if, at, at this conference, we would ask you to go first, and then we'll, we'll follow you all over there, okay? All right. Uh, there, I think it's uh, chicken strips, and I'm sure each chicken strip is going to beg you that they're the best chicken strip over the other chicken strips. <laughs> there won't be any in the regeneration. Somebody's yelling my name, yes. We're going to pray here. All right, and I think that is all I have. So we'll go ahead and pray and eat. Um, Lord, thank you so much just for this opportunity today to come and learn. And, and we thank you again for the fellowship uh, that we have uh, together uh, as fellow citizens, regardless of what church we are from uh, or, or where we're from, what town we're from, but we, we all belong to you and we're brothers and sisters in Christ and I'm just excited to to get to know these people and and to to host them today father and thank you for this opportunity we ask that you bless the rest of this day and we ask that you bless the food father uh, the nourishment of our bodies in Jesus name we pray amen <laughs> 